put forward um, this being recorded. has that the River, <laughs> River Ready team has done a lot of work to invite special guests and to invite a, a broad um, audience of uh, people in Eugene in addition to our neighborhood. So um, we are, we right now we have 70 participants signed in, so we're not going to go around and do introductions. Um, but if you will uh, register your name in the chat and when we start doing questions and discussion, if you'll um, uh, introduce yourself at that time when you get to speak. So um, Jackie, who is started up the uh, emergency prep team and has been very good leader in making this happen, is going to take it over from here. Oh, first we have, I want to find out if there is any announcements. We have a few minutes for announcements. If there's any urgent announcements, um, please raise your hand on the electronic hand raiser. Okay. Brenda, I see a, a, a flesh and blood hand. I don't see a, a icon, <laughs> but go ahead. Brenda, well, did you want to? Yeah, I just want to say this neighborhood has been watching Oakley Meadow turn into River Song co housing, and we have um, we have certificate to occupy as of about 10 days ago. And so people are actually moving into your neighborhood. There are 28 new households moving into the neighborhood, and only about uh, three or four of us are long term. Are, are, if I call, I'm a three year Eugene person. Some are longer, Eugene, but only three or four of us are Eugene originals. So, thank you, Brenda. Welcome to the neighborhood, uh, John. You're muted. Thank you. I just want to remind everybody that next Monday at five thirty, the city council was having a hearing on an ordinance that hopefully will control the Zippo laminator vibration issue for the neighborhood. I'll post something in the chat on how you can find out more and participate. But if you've been affected, please sign up and testify. Thank you. And I actually saw the report on the local news tonight on TV. Um, any other announcements? Okie dokie. Um, just to say that we uh, have a kind of a code of contact conduct in our neighborhood meetings, which is meant to, to promote civil discourse and um, personal attacks and opinions in the chat or in person are not appreciated. Most of us are very lovely uh, neighbor, neighbors. <laughs> so we just rely on that good faith. Um, John, did you not put your hand down or do you have another thing? Okay. So let's go on, Jackie, it's over to you. Thanks, Claire. All right, everybody. And in case anybody did not see, you can see the closed captioning. If you click on the show captions, CC button at the bottom of your Zoom controls in case you need to look at that tonight. Um, so I am here with the emergency preparedness team tonight. We formed this committee um, back in 2020, it kind of got started. and. We've been having meeting, monthly meetings um, ever since then. So it's been almost two years now, which is exciting. Um, the committee was really formed and kind of created a couple of goals that we brought back to the River Road Community Organization. And those were um, to increase community engagement, to identify hazards, risks, and threats within our neighborhood, and then also to develop some response plans whenever we do figure out what those risks and threats are to our neighborhood. And one of the risks and, and threats that we've identified is the fact that we all live so close to the Willamette River here in the very low elevation part of town. So um, we have contacted the US Army Corps of Engineers and invited them to come and talk to us tonight about dam safety and flood inundation mapping. So we're gonna be hearing from some of these experts tonight. Uh, we will definitely have time for questions and answers at the end of the meeting. So we are going to mute everybody during the presentation, but if you have questions, feel free to post them in the chat or save them to the end. We'll have you raise your hand to be able to ask them. Um, and then we'll also talk about some next steps at the end of the meeting. How can people get involved in whatever we learned tonight? Um, things like that. 
couple of reminders in the chat. Please sign in, especially if you're a River Road neighborhood, sending a direct chat to Charlesy. And then also, if you'd like more information about what we're doing in the realm of emergency preparedness or you have specific questions, we will post that email in the chat as well. It's readynorthwesteugene at gmail.com. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our presenters that we have here tonight. Uh, we have Dustin Bankston, uh, Deputy Operations Project Manager of the Willamette Valley Project. We also have Matt, Matt Chase here tonight, who is the Dam Safety Program Manager of the Dam and Levy Safety Section. And then also Natalie Ehrlich, uh, Geotechnical Engineer of the Dam and Levy Safety se uh, Section. And they're all here from the Portland District of the Army Corps. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters tonight. Let me go ahead and mute everybody. All right, so Matt and Dustin, over to you. I should be sharing my screen. Please let me know if you see that. Yes, I can see. Okay. Dustin, take it away. <laughs> Dustin, you may be on mute there. There we go. I, I had to wait to be unmuted there. I think Jackie just took care of me. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much uh, for having us here tonight. Um, well, I'll tell you, I breathe a sigh of relief. Uh, we did a lot of little uh, run-ups to this to make sure the technology worked. And I was nervous right up till this morning. We had kind of a nationwide issue with some systems. And so it was a little uncertain even early this morning how this would go. Uh, but I am I'm really appreciative to, to be here tonight to tell you what I think is a very good news story. And I think at the end of tonight, you know, success uh, from my perspective would look like uh, folks being really well informed about the infrastructure that we operate and maintain, uh, the benefits they provide, the risks that, that still exist, despite what I consider to be a very robust risk management program, uh, but also, you know, really well informed, right? You understand uh, the context that we live in, and we have some really smart people here to help tell that story tonight. Um, I am uh, the Deputy Operations Program Manager, a project manager for the Willamette Valley Project. That's the 13 dams uh, here in the Willamette Valley system. I've been here since 1993, so quite a while. I've seen uh, a few uh, extreme weather events, uh, a few other issues that we've managed through over time. So hopefully be able to share some of those experiences as we go forward tonight. Um, Matt, can you advance the slide? We'll just talk the agenda really quickly. Um, boy, done a lot of these presentations and I really think it's important to provide context first before we look at some of the potential consequences of the dams. And we'll talk a lot about our operations and maintenance, how we inspect and monitor our dams. Uh, I, like you, live below one of those nine dams uh, in Lane County. I raised my kids uh, below one of those nine dams in Lane County. And I told Charles earlier, I don't go to sleep at night worried about their safety, uh, but, but I am really well informed, right? I have a lot of insight into what we do from a dam safety program. And I think that's a very good news story uh, for us, for the folks that live, uh, live under uh, and below some of these structures. Uh, we'll talk about just some basics and how we quantify risk. And then some of the more detailed ways in which we not only um, quantify uh, the risk to our structures, but also manage interim risk until we can decide on what the the best corrective path is. Uh, and then we'll go to uh, the National Inventory of Dams tool and, and, and give you a look at a system that's all about transparency. It's all about helping folks understand the condition of the facilities, the structures, uh, the potential consequences from really, really unlikely events, kind of low probability, but certainly very high consequence events. And with that information, you know, maybe next steps for you all uh, uh, come from that and, and how you plan for uh, some of those contingencies, whether they're maybe higher likelihood or really low likelihood events. Okay, Matt, you want to advance our slide? So first, just to talk to you about the Willamette Valley Project, and I know a number of these structures are going to look very familiar to you, uh, but 13 what I'll call multi-purpose facilities, and I'll explain that a little bit more later, 
uh, completed, uh, you know, started construction in the late 30s uh, and completed construction of the Willamette Valley system as, as we look at it now and around 1969. Uh, just before the pandemic, right, 2019, we were commemorating 50 years of the Willamette Valley project in operation and we had a number of events planned to help uh, kind of raise or re-raise awareness. Uh, we know a lot of people have moved into the Willamette Valley in the last uh, 50 years of service, and, and it's not surprising at times to find folks that don't know uh, that they live below dams. Uh, and then in 2019, obviously, we had the big disruption, but we also had a, a, a very large snow event and, and a fairly large flood event in the Willamette Valley that did a, you know, did a lot of the work for us in terms of reminding people what is the primary purpose and why were these dams constructed. Um, all of these dams are a little bit different, right? Built over a, a span of years, a little bit different design, all have their own um, features that we monitor uh, in different ways. Um, but all of them providing tremendous uh, benefits to folks that live in the Willamette Valley. Next slide, Matt. So when I say multi-purpose project, flood risk management, which is our way of saying, you know, how do we protect from floods? But flood risk management is that prime driver. Um, since the dams were constructed, probably uh, in excess of $25 billion of flood damages, and of course, on an annual basis, those numbers increase rapidly as there's more development in the valley and people are moving in. In that April storm event uh, that I mentioned earlier, in a seven-day span, uh, the operation of our dams uh, to reduce flows on, the, on the, the downstream main stem of the Willamette reduced, uh, uh, prevented about $2 billion in flood damages, right? And that's just in a seven day span. So the increasing importance of these dams as we continue to uh, you know, expand the population of the Willamette Valley is, is really evident. All of those other purposes, irrigation, water supply, uh, recreation, fish and wildlife, all of those purposes are kind of in balance or in tension. Uh, it's, it's how we operate the system and try to maximize the benefits or minimize the impacts of the dams in the Willamette Valley. And while there are tremendous benefits, there are certainly impacts associated with dam construction. Um, those authorized project purposes, so these are part of the original authorization or subsequent authorizations of the dams, include irrigation and water supply. So an increasing population in Willamette Valley will need uh, both water for our homes and water for the things we grow and, and use and sell. Uh, we have significant uh, impacts or can have impacts on water quality. Flows in the main stem of the Willamette River would be far less during the, the hotter and drier part of the summers were it not for augmentation flows that we can provide from that stored water in our facilities. Eight of our facilities produce hydropower. We actually have a ninth hydropower facility that's operated by a private utility at Dorena. Um, and while those facilities don't produce uh, the volume of hydropower, uh, it's, they're fairly small in relation to some of the main stem Columbia and snake projects. They do provide significant benefits, uh, especially in and around peaking power demand. So like this evening when we come home and it's cold and the thermostat goes from 65 during the day to 72 or 70 at night, uh, and you turn on your lights and you turn on your stove, there's a peak power demand and, and the generation from our facilities uh, helps balance some of that peaking power demand. And some of what we use or when we produce hydropower, we can have effects on water quality. We manage temperature through a mixture of spill and generation capacity at a couple of our facilities. Um, Fish and Wildlife Program has been very visible. Uh, we are uh, aggressively working and have been for some time on how to improve the operation of our facilities or modify our structures uh, to uh, increase recovery of federally listed species. So salmon and steelhead being uh, really visible for most folks. We also have resident species like bull, uh, bull trout, um, that we are working uh, to try to improve so that we can provide as much benefit as possible the continued operation of, of our structures. And then of course, most folks understand the recreation value, you know, tremendously important, um, you know, the, the value of recreation in the hundreds of millions of dollars. But all of those are a function of how we use stored water during the summer conservation season. So as we fill these pools, as the flood risks go down in the, in the spring, we start to use that water over the course of the summer and maximize these benefits. And then we bring those pools back down to provide our maximum storage capacity so that we can prevent flooding downstream through the peak of that flood season. 
and that that process is repeated uh, annually. Um, and I mentioned earlier, I, we also have the Rogue Basin projects. We manage two projects in Southern Oregon, one Applegate all the way down by the California border, and, and the Rogue uh, Lost Creek project uh, is in the Rogue Basin as well. So lots and lots of uh, facilities that we manage. We're the size of some small districts in the Corps of Engineers. Uh, we have about 160 or so people spread out to do operations and maintenance of those facilities. And what I didn't mention is in addition to the dams themselves, you have hundreds of miles of revetments. So uh, structures that were built to stabilize the banks of the Willamette River, as well as a number of hatcheries that were constructed over that, that same span of time that we operate and maintain as well. Next slide, Matt. So how, how do we do this and how do we ensure the safety, your safety and my safety, uh, living below these dams. And there are a lot of things in play that help us uh, operate and maintain what I referred to earlier as a really robust dam safety program. In the lower right hand side of that slide, you see the operations and maintenance slide. And that is our day to day, right? Those people that are out on the facilities, uh, mowing uh, with tractors, walking the facilities, uh, operating and maintaining spillway gates. You know, that's our boots on the ground day to day. And, and any number of times that routine maintenance has identified issues before they became critical. Uh, back in 2005, if folks were around, you might remember that we identified an issue at Fern Ridge Dam. Uh, we had some uh, failure of a drainage system in the dam and we, we were losing material. That initially was identified by uh, one of our maintenance employees on a tractor who had mowed that dam a number of times and went through a depression and said, well, that's not right. Somebody needs to come take a look at this. And through a, you know, a very accelerated descriptive timeline here, we cut that dam in half and rebuilt it in, the, in about a year to put that back in service to provide uh, all of the benefits I talked about earlier. Um, supplementing or part of that ongoing operations and maintenance, you know, we have instrument, instrumentation on all of our dams to see how they're performing, uh, how water you know, or changes in water levels or changes in seepage that, that are expected to come through the dam. Those are monitored by our, our field staff. That information uh, since the dams were constructed and placed into service has been collected, analyzed, and maintained by our engineering folks in Portland. As a matter of fact, that picture right there to the right, I think, is a very young Matt Chase out doing some work in the field many years ago. So, um, but yeah, you know, very, very active program and things that we're adding to all the time as we learn more or see changes in conditions, uh, increasing our understanding. You know, the support of that really comes through our dam safety training program, and that's for our folks, but also for uh, just general awareness for people that live in and around our dams. And, and I couldn't tell you, but I know it's been a number of times in the time that I've been here where we've received reports from somebody walking their dog or on top of an earth hill and saying, hey, there's a hole here. Do you guys know about it? You know, and we will come out and we investigate. Typically and, and historically, that hasn't been a concern, but even that information is another set of eyes kind of helping us monitor the dams and, and kind of a nice uh, side benefit of folks being out and familiar with our facilities. And then underlying that are really uh, uh, regular and, and specific inspection cycles, annually, uh, periodic. So every five years, we do some real specific uh, uh, inspections that I'll talk about. And those inspections help inform uh, much more detailed risk assessments that Matt will discuss later. But all of that information, right, all of that information and all of that knowledge and ongoing maintenance of the system tells us conditions and helps us understand the risks associated with the facilities. And those are the things we know. But there are always, there always exists the potential for things we don't know. And that's where, uh, you know, emergency action planning and the exercises that we do with our staff uh, at the state level with local county emergency management officials help us think about those what ifs. What if this were, ha were to happen and how would we react? And I think that that's kind of the driver behind what you're trying to do is, is start to think about those what ifs and how do we best prepare for that? And we do the same thing. Our, our activities are focused on the operations and maintenance of the structure, whether it's routine or something that were to happen that is, that is outside of the routine. And then that includes how do we inform those folks who would then inform the public on how to best protect yourselves in an emergency. Next slide, Matt. Get the stars out of the way. 
So really detailed fo information, and, and it's a mixture of uh, very, very talented professional engineers that work within our district, working with our project staff on annual and every five-year cycles. Uh, we do routine inspections uh, as part of our, our, our normal O&M. Uh, those special inspections that I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the pictures that was on a prior slide had some folks that were roping or rappelling into our spillway gates to do very detailed inspections of those structural members. And that periodic inspection back in 2008 identified some structural deformation in one of our spillway gates. And that awareness led to a broader look at our spillway gates and identification of issues that we had with friction potentially in, in the, how the system operated. And we have been rehabilitating those spillway gates since 2008. So we have about 42 spillway gates in the Willamette Valley. We're very near completion uh, of the structural and mechanical and electrical rehabilitation of all of those gates at, in rough terms, about $3 million a gate. So significant investments in that infrastructure that, that protects folks downstream all coming uh, up as a result, not of a, of a crisis, not of a failure, but as part of our routine uh, inspection cycle, right? And so again, that, that, that is something that I hope uh, awareness of gives you comfort. It is a very, uh, a very robust system and, and there's another level to this. And that's what Matt's gonna talk about next. Matt, the next slide, really in terms of how we understand risk, because most of what you just saw was was pretty routine, but every 10 years, uh, we go to another level that helps us better understand if we're trying to get to what is the real risk, you know, this evaluation of hazards. So what's out there and what can happen, whether it is seismic or um, extreme hydrologic events. Uh, in those events, how will our facilities perform? So we start to talk about um, how we think they would perform and what could go wrong as part of operations and maintenance. And as we narrow in on what those plausible risks are and look at the consequences downstream, it points us in a direction where we can start to go in and further quantify, you know, go and find additional details and pull in additional information to really help understand and narrow down that risk. And that process through what we call a periodic assessment is where we are with a number of our dams in the Willamette Valley right now. Matt Chase, who is our dam safety program manager, is going to talk with you a little bit about how that uh, how that process works and how we're further refining risk. Matt, thank you, Dustin. Can you hear me all right? <clears throat> gotcha. So, like Dustin mentioned, just to kind of reiterate, when we talk about risk, risk has a very specific definition to us in the dam safety world. It uh, encompasses the hazards themselves. What are they? Are they floods? Are they earthquakes? Are they types of different operations? It also encompasses how the project is going to perform. How is it going to uh, react to an earthquake? How is it going to perform during a flood? And then that, um, and then we also include the consequences. What what is what is uh, downstream that could be inundated? So we consider all these things as part of risk. So when I talk about risk. Keep in mind, I'm kind of talking about all these things combined uh, when we look at risk assessments and defining, you know, basically what the level of risk we have. So it's, that's kind of an important thing to keep in mind um, as I kind of talk through this. So um, we have various levels of risk assessments. So uh, the risk assessments consider the potential hazards to the dam, again, the expected performance of the dam and the consequences. So um, Part of our routine program is that we can we, we uh, conduct what we call a, a periodic assessment. We do this for all of our dams and we do this every 10 years for our dams. So in addition to the 13 projects in the Willamette Valley, the two in a row, we also have another five projects along the Columbia River that the Portland District uh, has in our portfolio. So we roughly on average do two of these a year, these risk assessments. And during these risk assessments, we review the existing information. We'll go back all the way to the beginning of the project. We'll look at the original drawings, the original reports, um, all the original analyses that were done, all the inspections that have been happened in the in the past, all the kind of issues that we've run into. We'll 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 do we'll look at all that existing information. Then we'll also conduct a periodic inspection. 
Dustin mentioned earlier that uh, we conduct a very detailed periodic inspection every five years. So every other inspection, so every 10 years, we will, we will do that inspection as part of reviewing this existing information. And then we'll go into something called a potential failure modes analysis. And this involves, uh, you know, a, a really experienced team. So typically it will have geologists, geotechnical engineers, structural engineers, mechanicals, electricals. We'll have people from the project, you know, folks that work at the project, operators, et cetera, people that know that project really well. And we'll get into a room for almost two weeks and talk about different types of failure modes that you might encounter. And we, we kind of look at that and then we assess all that, looking at it from a risk standpoint. And that's how we kind of assess these projects. So we do that every 10 years. Um, then the next level of assessment are what we call issue evaluation studies. So these are advanced risk assessments and they're prioritized on a national basis and include a really detailed evaluation of the potential hazards. Um, the goal of the advanced risk assessment is to determine whether the risks are beyond a tolerable level. So, and if modifications of, of and long-term risk reduction measures are required. So this, 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 this is IES or an issue evaluation study will determine if, if our risks are tolerable, the project will go back to the routine cycle. But if we find that the risks are not tolerable, We'll move on to the next level, which is a dam, what we call a dam safety modification study. So these are to, for moderate to very high risk dams. And these are very in-depth studies. Um, we're gonna look at different alternatives to what we might do to improve the performance of that design, that dam, um, so that we can reduce the risk to below the tolerable level. So these are kind of the three levels of risk assessment. So again, the periodic assessment happens every 10 years. It happens to all dams. And then kind of based on what, how we rank these nationally, we'll go to an IES and those that we feel need more attention are gonna go to a dam safety modification study. And we have done risk assessments on all of our dams at this point now, at least once. So let's talk about hazard potential versus risk calculation. So this is, uh, as we get into the NID, you'll see, and we've had questions about this high hazard dam and what that means. I just kind of want to clarify this because, again, you'll see it in the NID. Uh, high hazard potential simply means that high hazard has nothing to do with really risk, as I defined it. But a high hazard potential is a dam where failure or misoperation will probably cause loss of human life. So the hazard potential really has nothing to do with the loading condition or the condition of the dam. It really just says that, hey, there's population downstream that could be affected by the, the failure of this dam. Um, significant hazard projects or dams where failure or misoperation results in no probable loss of life, but it could, could cause economic loss or environmental damage. Excuse me. And then low hazard potential um, would be that there's no loss of life or no low property damage. So those are the three types of hazard potential. And again, they're based on downstream consequences. So Keeping that in mind, we also have a risk classification. In the NID, there will be a risk classification attached to all the projects. And the risk classification comes out of these studies that what I described, the periodic assessment, the IES, the NAMCT modification study. And, the, and we rank our projects from very high risk down to very low risk. And again, this is based on those three components, which are the event, uh, how the dam performs, and also the downstream consequences. Actions to reduce risks. So if we feel that risks are not tolerable, um, we will uh, we'll install something called an interim risk reduction measure. So again, you know, if, if the core identifies any risks which are considered not tolerable, then we will implement this IRRM or ERM, we'll call them. And these ERMs are, are implemented that will temporarily lower the risk until a more permanent risk reduction measure is implemented. So, for example, we, have, we currently have some IRMs implemented at our, at our Labyrinth Valley projects. So Detroit, Cougar Hills Creek, and Lookout Point. And typically these IRMs are really to address um, some further studies we're doing, seismic studies at these projects. Or also, uh, for example, uh, Cougar, we have an ERM in place while we rehabilitate the second gate there. So we operate that project a little bit differently until we re we, we've re rehabilitated one gate and we're in the process of rehabilitating another. So until we do that, that one is, has a, a different type of operating procedure. So, um, so these projects are also in the queue to have an issues evaluation study or will begin soon. So 
Um, again, uh, the, we do have if we do identify projects that were that we that are what we consider not tolerable, we do have actions that we can use to kind of reduce that risk until we until we do some kind of permit repair. So uh, moving on into the inundation maps, so kind of moving in now into the NID discussion here or the National Inventory Dams discussion. So um, let's talk about inundation mapping. So what are, uh, what, why do we have these maps? Uh, well, the Corps uses them in our emergency action plan. So all of our projects have an emergency action plan and these describe the actions we're going to take if we run into an emergency. We also use these maps for risk assessments. So as I discussed earlier, part of the risk is we quantify the risk based on downstream consequences. That's part of the equation. So these maps help, help us to, to assess what kind of inundation we could expect during certain types of dam failures. And also these uh, inundation maps help the local emergency management agencies to, um, to develop evacuation and response plans. So a couple of really key things I wanna bring up before we get into the mapping. These are based on extremely unlikely and severe dam failure scenarios. And these are, I'll, I'll highlight extremely unlikely and severe dam safety failure scenarios. Um, dams have historically performed very well. Um, our dams uh, were well designed, well constructed, and they're well maintained. And we have a robust dam safety program. So um, the, I would consider these failures extremely unlikely. And they also capture extremely large flood events. So the uh, maximum high pool flood inundation, for example, uh, assumes a very, very large series of storms, which is very unlikely to occur, but there is always the probability that it could occur. And these maps also describe rap rapid and widespread failure. So a very quick failure is how these maps are kind of put together. What these maps are not, however, they are not the 100 year or FEMA flood insurance maps. That's not what these are. And these maps also are not in and, of, in and of themselves an evacuation or response plan. So again, that is the responsibility of the, of the local emergency manage, management organization to develop those response plans. But these are, again, used to help develop those plans. And these maps are not really specific to the cause of the dam failure. So it, is, it, it maps basically a failure, but it doesn't specify if it's an earthquake or a flood. Well, not an earthquake or some kind of misoperation. So that's what these maps are not. And they're kind of, you know, these are kind of the, the latest and greatest with using the latest technology and analytical tools we have, but you know, they are not perfect. Um, there are some assumptions that go into the making of these inundation maps. So a little bit about where we were and where we are now, where we started, you know, years ago, were static map books, printed books. And these were considered for official use only. There was some protected information in there, I guess you could say, um, that, you know, if, if these fell into the wrong hands, you know, we, we wouldn't want that. So we made those available to the local emergency managers and they still have these printed maps. And some of you may recall, we, you know, so they weren't, they weren't generally available to the public to, for viewing, though we did have some public viewings back in 2014, 2015 timeframe. Um, generally to view these, you would have to go make an appointment with the local emergency manager and look at them there. So, you know, they really weren't that available to the public. But now, rewind to today, we are now in the National Inventory of Dams Day. So we, the, the Corps of Engineers, Congress has authorized the Corps of Engineers to um, develop and maintain this website, or basically a database, which is the National Inventory of Dams. And on this database, you have publicly viewable maps, and you can look at different inundation scenarios, and those are out there for everybody to use. And there's a lot of other information on in the NID. So, so uh, I'll kind of walk into it in a second, uh, but um, basically the NID is a congressionally authorized database that documents more than 91,000 dams across the U.S. and its territories. Again, it's maintained by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and uh, um, there's lots of data fields for each of these dams, including the dams location and size, et cetera, and probably most importantly, the inundation maps. So I'm going to move on into so um, before I move to this slide, I'm going to go ahead and share my inundation map. I'm going to we're going to do a kind of a flying tour of the NID. So can everyone see my web see my screen here? 
Yes, we can see that. And Matt, if you would, could you define what inundation means for us as we're throwing that word around? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely. Inundation are, is the extents of the areas that will be covered with water. So being thus inundated by a, a release, a, a dam failure or a, or a release. Uh, so that's what I mean when I say inundation. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to clarify that. So this is the public public facing website for the National Inventory of Dams. As I mentioned, there are more than 90,000 dams nationwide, of which the Army Corps of Engineers owns and operates around 700, more than 700. So some some, some statistics here. So again, over 91,000, average day, average age 60 years. And we talked about the hazard potential. So 76% of those are high hazard dams. Again, um, could inundate you know people downstream. 6% are federally regulated dams. So, and then 70% are state regulated dams. So this website has got a lot of great information in it and it's kind of beyond the scope of our meeting here to go through everything. However, uh, I'll just kind of do a flying tour of some of the, the things that are kind of neat in here. So, um, and so just feel free to play around when you get a chance, but there's an area to learn more about dams. There's a dams 101 section that talks about all the parts of the dams, how they're built, how they operate, et cetera. Uh, so that's kind of a nice, nice uh, area to go explore. And then also what is the National Inventory of Dams? Kind of a brief history, some other information here, goes over some of the things I talked about, how it's used, et cetera. So spend some time exploring that. We've got a photo gallery that is in the works. So we have our own Applegate Dam is in this gallery. So that's kind of an, an evolving thing. And you know, and I, I guess I'll mention this website is evolving as well. So it will be it will be changing. More stuff will be added over time. Um, and then there's videos in here. So they're not showing up on my screen for some reason, but uh, there's some good videos here. And as a matter of fact, Dustin star is starring in one in the flood inundation map videos. Did you know that, Dustin? You're in this video. <laughs> so this video was taken during one of our public meetings. So that's something interesting to go look at. Um, so that's kind of exploring that. But so let's get back to the home screen and probably what you're probably interested in, in is looking at particular dams and inundation mapping. So there's different ways to navigate this, this, um, this NID and I'll kind of walk through this. So let's just look at Oregon in particular and we'll go look at Lane County in particular here. And so as this populates, um, you should be able to see some different dam projects. Oh, um, let's see if I can uh, scroll in a little better. Sometimes it's working better than at others, but here we go. You can scroll around and pick dams, or you can actually go into the, if you know the dam name of the dam you're looking for, you can go into here and search for it. Um, but let's kind of move in and look at Lookout Point. Um, see if we can get it going here. I'm just all right. <laughs> I'm going to do it the other way here. So I'm going to go ahead and go into what I call advanced search and just bring out lookout point. So this is lookout point dam here, um, just upstream of Eugene. And as you can see, there's a summary that kind of gives a general description of the dam when it was last inspected, uh, talks about its emergency action plan. There's a description here as well. And I'll just kind of scroll through here really fast, really talks about uh, the dam itself, how it's operated, a lot of other data having to do with the dam. And again, this is publicly accessible. Um, uh, the structure, a little more description here. Uh, uh, particulars about the dam, how what it's made of, how tall it is, et cetera, that kind of thing. Uh, and then the risk category. So this is going back to risk and the risk assessments we've conducted. Um, this risk summary comes out of the risk assessment. So when we do our risk assessment, these are kind of the upfront findings from our risk assessment. So that all that is available to look at. And it talks about the last time it was assessed, which was in 2019. Um, there's a there's a tab for inspections. So this is inspected every five years, like we talked about earlier, our PIs every five years. There's the hazard potential again high, again, because there are potential for downstream consequences. 
And then in the response and preparedness, there's an area that talks about when we've done our last drill and our last exercise or that kind of thing. But probably what we're really wanting to look at is the inundation mapping. So I'm gonna, there's a couple of different ways to do this. So kind of moving this over so we have some room, there's some, some layer controls here and there are different maps you can look at. And then there are different inundation layers that we can look at. So a little description, there's all these different inundation layers. So let me talk about them just a little bit. There's different types of inundation that we use for our risk assessments, but uh, pro, you know, but these represent different types of events. So this MH is what we call a maximum high pool breach. And this is this assumes I talked about earlier the probable maximum flood. This is the largest series of events you could we could statistically imagine, I guess. And this would be the inundation we could see from a from a maximum high pool breach. But I also want to point out that there's also a non-breach scenario. So if the dam performs the way it's supposed to, you know, there could be downstream inundation. And so by clicking on this, you can see what that inundation looks like. And you can scroll out, scroll in, and on the on the legend side, this talks about these are the this is the depth, inundation depths that you could see uh, as a result of this scenario. So even even when the dam is operating the way it's supposed to and not and without a breach, you still see that there's some inundation. And uh, the one I like to look at, so this is a max high breach. So again, if the dam breached, that would show you what that inundation could look like, you know, compared to, you know, if it didn't breach. But the one I, I kind of like to look at a lot and the one, when we, especially when we start thinking about earthquakes and that kind of thing, um, the NH, which is the normal high pool. And I consider this, I like to call this the sunny day failure mode. So. This is during summer when you've got the, the reservoir at conservation level. So, and if we had a breach, you can click on that and it'll show what that estimated inundation will look like. So in the NIB, it talks, it, it describes what these various scenarios mean. And, uh, you know, we can go into that later if you like, but um, it is in, in the NIB, it does discuss what all those different layers are. So this is a, kind of a fast way to look at these, but I like to actually look at it using the advanced map viewer. There's a few more features in there that are a little more customizable. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and click the advanced map viewer and uh, let me know when that shows up there. Yep, we can see that now. All right, great. So what are we looking at? We see lookout point, Dexter, Fall Creek, Hills Creek upstream, Darina, Cottage Grove. And if we zoom out, we can see even more dams. So I'll say also that the Portland District, all of our dams are loaded into the NID now. Um, so we, we're, we're up to date on that and our stuff is, is up to date. So kind of similarly to what I showed before, um, we look, want to look at lookout point, we can look at these breaches. So this is the normal high breach. Again, this would be like a sunny day breach and we'll let it populate here. This gives you a little bit of customizable, more customizable here. So that would be the inundation boundaries for this. You can go into the raster class and you can see the different depths of inundation. So this is how much inundation you have over that particular elevation, wherever that's located. So, you know, if you can zoom into the, the greater downtown Eugene and look at how deep that water would be in that case. Uh, there's also a, a traffic uh, raster here. So this describes, you know, how well vehicles could move around in that type of inundation. And you can also customize this. So um, if you want to look at different, um, different, in, different types of inundation. So if you wanted to say, look at a value greater than 15 feet, if you wanted to say, well, is there any area that's greater than 30 feet, say? Um, and if I wanted to give it another color, say I could do that. Go ahead and say that. And you can, so it's a bit customizable. So you can see other types of, you know, other information. It also allows you to, uh, you can take measurements. So you can measure distances and areas and that kind of thing. I won't go too deeply into that. Um, you can bookmark this. So there are different layers you can use. There's, you can look at uh, like where your airports are, you know, that'll show up on here did earlier at least, <laughs> uh, colleges. So there's different types of features that you can load into this thing. 
So this is really helpful for people who are emergency managers to know there's critical, so the, the different types of in infrastructure, those will show up on this map. Um, so there's a lot of neat, really neat features with this. And um, again, different maps, backgrounds, you know, you, you can topo maps, et cetera. So, so one thing I wanted to caution you about though, and I, there was a question that came up earlier during one of our discussions and, uh, um, and I, I kind of learned about this just lately. So uh, let me, let me talk to it a little bit. Um, let's see, it's possible to, um, so I've got lookout point. These are the, this, this is the inundation for lookout point. And, uh, and so you can, the NID allows you to actually show different multiple dams at once. And this is something I think we need to kind of go back and look at. So I wanted to, this is a question that came up. So I wanted to kind of address this so there's no confusion about this. This is the normal height breach for, for lookout point. Um, as we kind of talked about, I'm gonna go back and reset my raster here because I don't care for that. Um, I use that setting as just an example, but I don't really like it normally. So we'll bring this back here. There, let it let it repopulate there. Okay, so it is possible to actually show two dams reaching at the same time on this tool. This is not how it. This is not how this is modeled, however. So, and the reason I bring this up, it was it was in the talk in, in the discussion we had earlier. So, though it allows you to show these two dams, this really doesn't accurately show what that inundation would look like with both of those dams at the same time. They're not really modeled this way. What you could do is use this as a comparison. So if you wanted to know what the inundation for Fall Creek looked like that, looked like in comparison to say, to say Fall Creek, you could do that. But really it is not intended to be combined like this. So just kind of a caveat. Um, so it does allow you to show that, but is not technically I guess, accurate as far as the inundation boundary and depths. These two projects have not been modeled with the, with the simultaneous failure. So um, just a caveat for that. Um, however, you know, looking at uh, some of the other maps upstream, say Hills Creek, um, close that out. The Hills Creek, and I, I just mentioned this because it was asked earlier, it was one of the read ahead questions we got. So Hills Creek, the Hill, Hills Creek Dam inundation does include. So when we have uh, we have dams in series, the, the the inundation from Hills Creek does include these other two downstream dams. So it would be improper to combine them, you know, on this tool. I hope that kind of helps a little bit. Um, but anyway, that is kind of a flying, I guess, tour of the National Inventory of Dams website. Um, there's again, there's a lot of good information on this. However, we know that, you know, having this publicly available is going to, you know, is going to prompt questions from people in the public as to how to operate it, what it all means. And we're here to help, I guess, facilitate that discussion. We're happy to have meetings and talk about it and try to get folks. Uh, on, we want folks to use this tool. We want them to be aware of the risks uh, living downstream of, of a dam, what those pose. We want them to be aware of that. And also it's a, is, I guess, a way for to encourage dialogue between the public and also their local emergency management agencies to, you know, how you would plan for uh, an event like this. So uh, I, that's really what I have to talk about on the NID. I will, I guess at this point, open the floor to questions and to questions to the whole, everybody on the team here. So thank you for, uh, thank you for listening to me and I hope that was helpful to you. Thank you, Matt. And if anybody does have questions, you can either post them in the chat or raise your hand. We'll invite you to unmute and ask your question. I see some clap reactions. People are uh, excited about this presentation. We'll start with Claire. Invite you to unmute. Thank you for such a great overview. Um, I'm curious if you could speak to anticipating the effects of climate change, particularly drought and the impact of that on electricity and or, you know, all different impacts that might have. Uh, Dustin, can you take that or you want me to take a shot at it? 
I, that's a big question, Claire. Um, I, I will say this, you know, one of the things that, that we're, we're constantly doing is evaluating, um, you know, the condition of our structures and the effects of change around us. So wildfire, as an example, has dramatically changed our landscape, right, and, and has changed how water comes off in the system. And so we're evaluating our operations as the result of that. Uh, I don't know that there's a great predictive model out there that says, you know, what um, what drought will look like for us. You know, things that I have read seem to indicate more extreme events, you know, as kind of a general predictor. So, you know, drier dries and more severe, more intense storms. And we've seen a couple of those type events play out in late spring in the last couple of years. So, well, you know, we're constantly evaluating um, the operation of our system, and in general, in general, the more water we can store in the spring, and it's going to become increasingly that way that we store in the late spring, the greater uh, the, the range of opportunities we have during conservation season for downstream flow augmentation, for water supply, for recreation, et cetera. And, and we have told this story, I've told this story as long as I've been here, you know, really, what we store in the system is a function of late spring rains, right? What we get in that um, April, May, uh, and June timeframe really make the difference between a, a dry year and an abundant year. And so, you know, as that changes, and there are going to be changing demands on the system, both in terms of what we what we expect from it and what we can store uh, as we try to operate our facilities in ways that are more beneficial for fish passage uh, or less impactful in other ways. Uh, we're going to have to continue to pay attention to, you know, that change in how uh, kind of how things come to us. But right now, there's not a great predictive model that that I know of that says, okay, here's here's exactly how we would change our operations in terms of hydropower production uh, or um, you know storage based on climate. All right, up next I see Julie. Good evening. Again, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I would like to encourage that perhaps we have some follow-up presentations. There was a lot of very deep material uh, presented this evening. Thank you. Um, I actually have two questions. The first one is, uh, are any of the Lane County dams uh, scheduled or being reviewed for removal to help with uh, salmon spawning and salmon runs to restore uh, historic runs? And then my second question, uh, is there any work being done um, as in the Netherlands that is currently being done to relocate people out of the floodplain and inundation sites? Thank you. So Julie, can you still hear me? Hopefully folks can still hear me. Yes, we can. I can hear you. Okay, I just lost the video portion. So as long as you can still hear me. Um, I appreciate the question, Julie. Uh, one thing that, that I would draw folks attention to is that later this month, um, I think around the 30th, uh, the core will be releasing uh, the draft uh, set of recommendations for the update of our programmatic environmental impact statement. And that looks at a range of alternatives uh, of how we will operate our facilities in the future to try to, um, to diminish the impact and provide the greatest range of benefits. Um, and so in looking at that, you will see the range of alternatives that are being considered, uh, not only to, to improve conditions for fish and water quality downstream, but also meet those other benefits, uh, those other authorizations that, um, that I mentioned before. Dam removal is not one of the alternatives that, that is being considered. We needed to consider um, modifications to our operations that were within our existing authorizations. Uh, what, what that would, you know, removal would be a very different process. But I would really strongly encourage folks to pay attention and be engaged. There will be some sessions in early December that provide an overview of, of where we are in that uh, uh, new EIS. And, um, and that's a great time to become informed on uh, what some of those changes might look like and what those trade-offs are in terms of benefits. Um, and as to the second half of your question, I, I, I don't have an answer to that one. That would not be something that we were specifically involved with as far as relocating folks out of the floodway.
All right, thank you. I see Jan up next. All right. Uh, thanks, Matt and Dustin. Uh, I know a lot of people have been wondering about this information for a long time, so it's good to see, uh, should I say, more forthcoming sharing information, and it's great to see everybody here with this kind of an interest. Uh, well, we live downstream, don't we? Well, my question is, have there been any Pineapple Express events in recent years when uh, there's a low snowfall and then a big warm mm -hmm. rain event, have there been any times in recent years where the people at the Corps of Engineer kind of mm -hmm. were saying, uh, this looks serious, mm -hmm. any types of worries that there could be a, an overflow just because of upstream flooding? Uh, that's a great question. So I know you've lived in the valley for a long time or in the Northwest for a long time. When you say Pineapple Express, the 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 new term that, that we're using is atmospheric river, right? Classifications, um, you know, of severity and how much moisture it's bringing in. But the, the short answer to your question is yes, we've had some really interesting recent events. If you, I know if you were here in 2019, you remember how impactful that snowstorm was. And then, you know, on top of that historic snowfall that really uh, challenged us, challenged everyone in terms of access to facilities. Uh, in April of that year, you know, we had uh, an unusual, very unusual late rain event that uh, kind of came in and parked itself in the southern end of the Willamette Valley. And you saw that that uh, prediction for rainfall in like the Rau River Basin near Dorena and a few other places go from uh, three inches to six inches to, you know, more than that in terms of actual. So you had rain on snow in low elevations. That's what, that's typically what had meant uh, historic flooding potential in the Willamette Valley. In the, in, you know, and I've been here since 93, that's the first time that I had seen all of our reservoirs at or around 100%, just, just right at the top of, uh, of our, um, you know, flood storage capacity. And we had some pretty unusual releases. To my knowledge, we didn't have any impacts on structures. So we we were right there on that very thin margin. And that period from, say, April to June, remember this last summer, we had such a wet May and June, which really helped us in some areas provide conservation storage. But it's not typical for us to see really heavy rainfall in those late events. So as we're gradually refilling the pool, we try to get those pools as full as we can uh, by you know, Labor Memorial Day each year in, in mid mid May, uh, we're also at a very risky time, right? So we're higher in our in we've got less flood storage. So any of that late season uh, rain that comes in can be a blessing, can also be a real challenge for us. So we have had some of those recent events that that are kind of educational flows for everybody, and and you saw higher flows downstream in a number of areas uh, than you have in the past. So it, it has happened recently, and, and, and it was a, an opportunity. We were very fortunate, and I think we had uh, strong success with how we operated and maintained the facilities, uh, but really unusual weather conditions for, for us here in the Valley. All right, next up, I see Charles E. Yes, hi. Um, so uh, the two risks I saw referred to most often in the NID for the potential of damaging the dams were um, if there was an unusually wet season and the ground gave way. And another set of uh, risks would be a very strong earthquake. And we know we have the risk of the Cascadia subduction um, potential. So um, in the River Road neighborhood, we are kind of landlocked in a way. Um, if we had a very severe earthquake, the potential exists that the bridges and overpasses around us could fall. Um, and we worry a lot, I worry a lot, about uh, evacuation potential and so on. So Part of what is intriguing about a dam breach is that we would have a period of time between the breach and when the inundation would be at its maximum height. 
And now we know we don't know the circumstances, of course, of what that breach would be. But if we use the maps, the inundation maps, and say perhaps someday that could happen, even though uh, it may seem unlikely, it could happen. How how do we deal with that potential? Um, do you have anything to say about how much time uh, we might a ballpark as to when that breach occurs? say it's Lookout, say it's um, Hill Creek uh, and that water reaching us uh, in huge amounts so that we would have notice presumably um, to do something if we could. Yeah, Matt, why don't, why don't, you wanna take a stab at that one? I know you did a little bit of looking uh, within the NID and what those travel times were. I did, thanks Dustin, thank you for the question. So. Um, the NID does not have the timing information. It's, that is not part of the NID. Um, I don't know if that's a future addition or what, but at this point, the NID does not have that timing. Um, the print maps, the ones that we distribute to the to the locals, uh, the counties, uh, cities, et cetera, those do have some timing information. Um, uh, so the print maps do have some timing information. I guess I have to couch this a bit. I have to be careful with this because I have to kind of go back and, and kind of repeat, you know, um, there's a lot of assumptions that go into these maps and they are not really specific to the type of failure. So, um, and they are also large, large events that are unlikely, but I did look, to, I took a look at for lookout point. So for the normal high pool, which is kind of the one I like to use as an example, because that's the, you know, you know, we're all, you know, that's kind of the pool is at that elevation for part of the summer, at least. So it's it would be roughly be, and I'm going to say very roughly. So between six to six and eight hours to arrive uh, to downtown Eugene proper. And I guess to know more to, to get more deeper into that, you would have to uh, arrange a visit, I guess, with the Lane County or, or one of the or the city of Eugene who has has those uh, printed map products. I hope that helps. Thank you. All right, before I move on to the other hands, I do wanna read out some of the questions that are coming through in the chat. We've been getting answers from the presenters in the chat. So in case anybody can't see those, um, we've had a question of, do any of the dams have any humans on site? And if so, how often? Uh, the answer to that was that the dams do have people on site on a regular basis. There are operators, mechanics, electricians, engineers, park rangers and natural resource specialists. And all of the folks are trained in dam safety to provide both routine surveillance or maintenance and support during non-routine events like flood or earthquake inspections. Um, one of the other questions that we have gotten out here was a question about the Hills Creek Dam. It was one of the last ones to be added to the inundation map. So there was a question about why that delay was there. Um, there may not have been a specific reason, um, and the team that has offered to follow up for a better answer there, the, um, some of our presenters. Uh, the NID was a development all of last year, so those content creators could have been loading all of the maps across the country. And as our presenters mentioned, there are 700 plus dams throughout the country, so that dam specifically might have just been lower on the list to be added to the map. Um, and while I catch up on the other questions, I'll go ahead and call on Ed. I see your hand up next. Hey, Ed, I think you might be muted there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I got a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, you know, when the, the measures of inundation are two to six feet or and six to 15 feet and above 15 feet, what does above 15 feet indicate? Well, that is, that is, I'll go ahead and take that. That's just the, you know, uh, in that NID tool, there are only so many, uh, I think they have like four different depth options. Uh, but as, as I just showed, and, I, and if, if you go back into that, either it is customizable. So you can look at, so they, those were just kind of the default depths that were chosen by the, the makers of the NID. So in that customizable uh, menu, you can actually go in and look at different inundation depths kind of in my display. I took up to 40 
So anything above 40 was showing up in kind of a red color. So that is customizable. So you could actually go in there and look at different inundation depths if you if you if you so wanted to. So that was in the advanced map viewer um, where you have all those other features. Okay. And then the other one is um, how likely is it for an upstream if an upstream dam fails that there's a domino effect and it causes a downstream dam to fail? Well, the likelihood of that would be based on a risk assessment, I guess. So, but just uh, for um, at least for the case of the example I showed for Hills Creek, and I saw the question came up in the chat. Um, for the Hills Creek in Hills Creek inundation, that that inundation assumes that if Hills Creek had a failure, that the the two sub subsequent dams, that being Lookout Point and Dexter, those two would also overtop and fail. So that inundation downstream assumes the failure of those two subsequent dams. I can't speak to if that's how they're all modeled, but I know that that in that particular scenario, that was how it was modeled. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Belcher, I see you next. Thank you. Um, this echoes the question in the chat as well, and that is, we all know that someday in the future we're going to have a significant earthquake in our, our neighborhood. And my question, therefore, is, has there been any um, modeling done about how well the dams would survive such a um, earthquake magnitude eight or nine on the coast, and um, including what might happen if there was a landslide during a full pool event and how that might cause water to slosh over the dam and compromise the dam. Thank you. Natalie, do you want to take a crack at the seismic question? Sure, I can take that and thanks for bringing that up. That was actually, um, I'm trying to catch up on some of these chat questions. Lots of good questions, so thank you. Um, there's kind of two answers uh, to your question about the seismic studies. So there's kind of two things that we consider. There's number one, is that hazard itself and the loading. So given a certain earthquake occurs, how much shaking do we get at the dams? And um, we do have uh, recent studies um, that have been conducted by um, seismic experts, so seismologists or people who study uh, earthquakes. Um, those were conducted in 2017, 2020. And these studies have given us an idea of how much shaking could occur at our projects for different earthquake scenarios. So considering all of the potential faults in the region, including Cascadia subduction zone, and maybe how extreme that event could be. So for a given fault, you could have lots of different earthquakes that occur on that fault. So, so that could depend on where it ruptures and how big that rupture is. And so we use that information directly in those risk assessments that Matt was talking about, where we consider all of those different loading scenarios from most likely, so that most likely Cascadia that we I'll talk about and think about a lot to really extreme events that are very unlikely to happen, but could have very devastating effects. And then the second part to that is, well, what do we do with that information? So those loadings are what we put directly into um, our uh, stability analyses that look at, you know, what would happen to our concrete structures, our earthen dams, uh, when we inject them to that shaking. And so uh, we do um, evaluate this every 10 years with our um, periodic assessment, risk assessments that Matt mentioned. And then we also have advanced studies that are ongoing um, through the, um, we have a risk management center that's kind of headquartered um, in Denver, Colorado. And they're spearheading a lot of these more advanced studies that look at what could happen to our projects under these really extreme loadings. And so kind of the, it's kind of a long, long-winded answer, but the, you know, the short answer is uh, we expect based on the uh, analyses we've done so far to expect to perform well in these likely earthquake scenarios where we have less certainty is what happens in these really extreme and likely cases and that's where we have these um, uh, these advanced analyses are looking into what specifically could happen so did that answer some of your question or do you have a follow-up for that well, you've told me what the studies were, but you haven't told me what they told you. Are, are you saying that your expectation is during the Cascadia event, the dams will not fail? So, yeah. So in our, in our most likely Cascadia scenario, um, we expect the dams to perform well. We would expect to see some damage. 
but we wouldn't expect a catastrophic breach at our dams and that most likely Cascadia earthquake. So what kind of things would you see? We could see cracking in the concrete structures. Um, we could see some earthen structures themselves, some cracking in those earthen dams. So we would expect to see some damage based on what we're seeing so far as we don't expect a catastrophic failure for the most likely Cascadia earthquake. And that analysis includes the potential of a landslide throwing into, say, Hills Creek at a uh, high level, high water yeah. level? Yeah, so that's actually, that's, um, Matt mentioned these periodic assessments, these risk assessments, and kind of what those involve is, you know, we, we sit around in a room for two weeks and brainstorm everything that could possibly go wrong for these range, range of earthquake scenarios and range of flood scenarios. And a landslide um, depositing into the reservoirs is something that comes up and that we consider for all of the projects and these risk assessments. And what we found is that um, just based on the amount, the landslide hazards around the reservoirs and just the amount of material that could go in there is we wouldn't expect a catastrophic failure or a breach to occur from that. We could have some sloshing over, over the dam, but um, ultimately what we find is that it wouldn't result in a failure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I see you, Charles, you up next? Yes. Um, let's say that a very unlikely breach occurs in the middle of the night, 2.30, 4 o'clock. How is that breach discovered? And how long is it that an alert is sent out? By whom? And how are we, what will we as residents experience as a result of our alert system? So Charlie, I can I can tell you a little bit about what what might tell us that there's a problem, say, in the middle of the night, uh, and then maybe encourage you for a follow-on conversation with I, I didn't see in the list if we had anybody from a local emergency management agency to talk about how notifications happen. But if we discover any kind of an issue with our facilities, whether it's an abnormal release of water uh, or conditions that indicate a potential failure or imminent failure of our dams, we would make immediate notification to Lane County and Lane County would begin to exercise their notification and evacuation plan, uh, depending on that event. Um, at the risk of, of not being able to describe it ac accurately, I would say I just strongly encourage you to uh, work with the City of Eugene Emergency Manager, Carrie Carl, and Lane County to talk with you about how you get signed up for their alert notifications and, and what their process is for notifying people that, that are in harm's way potentially. Uh, we have a lot of different things that, that monitor pool elevations that would indicate uh, an issue for us, uh, you know, and then we have our routine inspections going on. But anything that would indicate uh, something that was outside of the norm, even if, uh, you know, it was very preliminary, we would begin that process of communication with the county emergency managers so that they could begin to prepare uh, for that what if, right? What if the situation worsens? What if uh, we need to start to move people? And, and that, that function is really a function of local emergency management. Can you be a little more specific about how much time passes uh, in your estimation between a breach and you contacting the county uh, offices? Well, to make sure that I understand your question correctly. As soon as we would notify, it, become aware of any issue, we would make immediate notification to the county. So that's what I could specifically tell you. It's very hard to hypothesize around uh, a condition, you know, that that we, you know, may not have identified yet worsening. But as soon as we would identify something, uh, we would make that immediate notification. And then the county has a means of um, identifying people within a given area and making uh, notifications multiple ways uh, that include, you know, telephone notifications and call outs, as well as door to door notifications for folks that are in an area of potential impact. So I, I, I think I know what you're saying, but it's really hard to hypothesize around, okay, well, you know, would it take minutes or hours for us to identify something? 
We have a lot of uh, instrumentation in place that would tell us if there's a change in pool elevations or something that was happening downstream um, in an earthquake scenario. It immediately triggers. So even that small earthquake that we had recently uh, triggered inspection requirements uh, for us at all of the dams within the Willamette Valley. And we were able to get folks out on the structures within hours to do inspections on all of those facilities. So it's, it's a little bit of a difficult question to answer, but our notification systems with Lane County have been tested in a number of events, flood events recently, fire events. Uh, we have that communication path really well dialed in with the county. Well, that's good to hear. And we will be following up with them, of course. Um, and the reason I'm asking is that that window, that estimated window of six to eight hours is what we would be working against. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's the sense of urgency here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I see Jolene up next. Thank you so much for all this great information. So following on Charlie's question, you can see where our anxieties drift to <laughs> in terms of what we're most worried about. And, and um, you know, I'm relieved to hear that the current assessment is that the dams will hold if there's a major seismic event. I know there's always potential for the unknown, but, um, and I noticed in the chat, this article was referenced that there is a, a strong likelihood of a megastorm event in California at some point in the near future based on climate change models. And I, I read that article and I thought, well, I think there's a likelihood of a megastorm event in the Pacific Northwest based on our recent experiences. And so, I understand your instrumentation would tell you if, you know, you were, the flow was going over the top basically in that kind of situation. Is there, um, is there any system in place for letting us know when it were like at 75% and there's heavy rain predicted overnight? I don't know. Like, is there some uh, yeah. way? Yeah. Like, no. you know, so we're not worried if we're having really heavy rain on top of snow and, we don't really know how full the dam, the you know, the reservoirs are, and I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah, and there are two, and and unfortunately, I have lost my uh, my video, so I can't put the links in the chat. But one area that I would steer everyone to is the Willamette Teacup diagram, and what the Willamette Teacup diagram will show you is where we are in pool elevation. Um, at, at any given point, right? How much storage we have left. It will show you inflow and outflow. Um, when you hover over the little orange hash marks that look like dams, it'll also tell you where boat ramp elevations are and things you can use in non-emergency events. So it's a great quick reference to uh, where we are sitting in terms of system storage. And if you think about, you know, the, the kind of what if scenario, knowing where we are in pool elevations at any time of the year, you know, uh, can help you, uh, at least understand the, the potential risk. That normal uh, high scenario, the sunny day scenario that Matt mentioned, we get there typically in the early spring, but we don't stay there very long. And increasingly, it's rare that we get there at all of our pools. So it's, it's pretty unusual for us to be like we were this year uh, at full pool all at the same time for an extended period because we had some extended rains into June more likely you'll see us uh, further down in our conservation storage, but it is a great tool to kind of understand the overall risk and, and what we're releasing out of the dams. The other site that I really think uh, folks will get, out a lot, get a lot out of is the Northwest River Forecast Center site. So it will tell you, uh, and there's, there's a bunch of information that you can have just by thumbing around through that site uh, on what the forecast is, uh, what the overall reservoirs look like, if any uh, areas are going to go up to action stage or bank full, above uh, bank full stage or to flood stage. Uh, and, and, and you can see not just the local, but the regional kind of picture of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And those are really good tools to be informed on what's going on around you so that you can be thinking forward into those, um, you know, lower consequence, but maybe uh, higher likelihood events. So the periodic flooding type events. 
And if you get into and you find out how to get logged into those notification systems that the county and the cities have, those will be the same systems that, that benefit you, whether it is a minor flood event, a major flood event, or some type of you know, very low likelihood, but highly impactful seismic event. Great, thank you. I did have one question, a direct uh, question in the chat come through. They mentioned periodic assessments being done every 10 years. Um, are all of the dams, are they on a staggered schedule or are multiple dams assessed at the same time? I'll go ahead and take that. Uh, this is Matt. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that we have in the Portland district portfolio, we have 20 dams. So we have to do one every 10 years. So roughly we do two a year on average. So uh, it just wouldn't be possible to do all of them, you know, in all at the same time. So uh, we have, a, I guess, kind of a schedule that we've developed to, to, to do all those risk assessments. So, you know, basically we're, they're, on a, they're on a rotating basis, um, you know, in no, in no particular order, I guess. Um, but uh, these these more these these more in depth risk assessments are are kind of you know um, you know it, it, th those are established you know based based on the perceived risk of the project. Thank you, and I see John's hand. John Belcher. Um, thank you again for allowing me to ask a question. Um, this is based on old information. A long time ago, I had the opportunity to tour. Lookout Point Dam, and in the operations room, there was a huge graph on the wall that was the curve. And I was told at that time that at no time would um, the Corps of Engineers ever veer from that curve. Um, but since then, my understanding is that at least in one case in Utah, following that curve caused a dam to fail. So my question is, is that curve still sacrosanct and has it been modified to account for current changes in our climate. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, so the the curve that that he's referring to, each one of our dams has uh, an authorized observ, uh, authorization. So how we operate um, throughout the year uh, to provide uh, the the greatest amount of conservation season storage benefits and diminish. Uh, flood risks to the greatest extent possible. Those the, those curves have not been modified, and and you are correct. We do not um, we do not increase risk uh, to try to accomplish other authorized purposes. Uh, you will see us in most cases operating below those curves, and it's only uh, typically where we have uh, very dry situations where we we see or can foresee. Uh, some real struggles to get conservation storage back for some of those um, other benefits like fish and wildlife and water quality benefits that you'll see us storing water earlier in the season. But there is always some tension around that, right? There's, there's an interest at times from folks to say, well, we want to make sure that that pool is full every summer for recreation purposes. And the answer to that is no, because if, if we fill sooner, we increase the risk to flooding downstream. So we're going to continue to operate you know, along this authorization line. And to this point, none of those curves have been modified based on climate. So we are still operating under those same rule curves or those authorization curves that we had when the project was developed. But we have a lot more tools now in terms of prediction for uh, flows and, uh, and, and for forecasts than we perhaps did in the past. So, you know, that that is something that it's a, it's a, Question that gets asked a lot, typically on the on the side of how can we store more water for those purposes in the basin, uh, and I'm not familiar with the example that you you cited in terms of how it it ended up causing dam failure. So, sorry, I can't speak to that. Thank you. I thought I saw one more hand up. Maybe somebody put it down. Uh, Charles e? Um, I just wanted to ask um, the Army Corps speakers, um, are the main maintenance of, oh, I'm, I should defer to, to Kate and these other people, but the, the maintenance of these dams rests on the funding that the Army Corps gets for that, uh, correct? And um, 
I'm just hoping it says secure funding. So I want to see these dams maintained. Thank you. I'm sorry, I, I'm not. I, I'm not sure if there was a question there, but I would say that you know our our dams and and part of this um, this periodic assessment work and these issue evaluation studies helps us quantify risk across all of the facilities, all of the structures that the Corps of Engineers uh, administers nationwide, so that funds can be brought to bear on you know the facilities that that have the highest potential consequences or are in the greatest need, and so part of this overall risk portfolio that we manage uh, helps the Corps of Engineers maintain focus, uh, you know, keep keep funds focused on the highest priority needs across the across the system. And I mentioned an example earlier, you know, the spillway gates within the Willamette Valley are a good example of really high um, uh, critical infrastructure with really high consequences if there was a failure. And, you know, you've seen over the last 10 or more years really aggressive recapitalization of that infrastructure that protects people downstream. So I think that's a good news story that speaks to your question, Charles E. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, Kate, I see you up next. I have a quick question about the revetment um, part of uh, flood control. So uh, in Santa Clara, I know there are areas where the revetment in recent years has been completely washed away and that has um, precipitated loss of acres of farmland here and particularly across from the confluence of the Mackenzie and Willamette in our neighborhood. There's a neighbor who's had that happen and she doesn't have any recourse to replace revetment or reclaim property. And, uh, how, how often is revetment along the floodway inspected and then what is the process for failure of revetment and then how is that accounted for in the modeling because that provides a really different outcome for the people downstream. That, that's a great point and I'm going to give you a partial answer and then a suggestion because it is a really uh, complex subject that to do justice to is probably a presentation in, in and of its own. I know Caroline Williams who's our dam safety and levy program manager is I saw her signed in earlier, but what I would say is this, is that, you know, the, the revetments that were put in along the Willamette River were put in really for the purposes of stabilizing the banks. Uh, most, if not all of them, were not designed to be true levees to provide flood control. A number of those revetments, after they were constructed, were turned over to local entities to operate and maintain. And, and so the answer to your question of what is being done around those is, is kind of a question of authority and ownership based on history. And that's what makes it so complicated. Uh, but there are, as you mentioned, you know, the, those a lot of those structures are are fairly old, and the river is dynamic. And some of those structures have started to to uh, to peel away from the banks. Um, and so, I would suggest that if folks are really interested, that we maybe form up a a future conversation to help explain the levy program, and, and really what uh, what we do there in terms of inspection and what local local entities do in terms of operation and maintenance of some of those structures. And if Caroline's typing furiously in the chat, no, Dustin, you got it all wrong, then I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I do, before we move to the last question here, I just posted in the chat as well, our next monthly emergency preparedness team meeting is going to be on December 6th, and we're going to dedicate that whole meeting to unpacking things that we learned here tonight, talking about follow-ups and, and next steps. Um, looking for volunteers to take things to the next level. So everybody feel free to join us if you're available. And our last question is from Laura. Great, thank you so much for this very interesting meeting. I just wanna make sure that I understand the Cascadia earthquake statements that were made. I heard that in the most likely Cascadia scenario, the dams will hold. What is that scenario and am I, right that it's not the 9.0 you know one in 500 year event and that at this point you don't know what the impact would be of that hey laura that's a really good question and i was actually attempting to type a response and realize that this is a very complicated answer that maybe warrants more than a typed response so 
I'm going to try to do a visual with my hands, so I apologize if it's not totally clear, but when we talk about most likely earthquakes in Cascadia, I guess my short answer is that yes, that most likely event we consider is that 9.0 magnitude event. So we have two plates that are colliding with each other and the Pacific plate that's sinking down under the North American plate and kind of where that earthquake occurs. So where that break occurs along that fault um, impacts how likely and how large that earthquake is. So even though we know we have this this fault source at the coast that looks like this, there's a lot of different scenarios that can occur from a rupture on that fault. So um, we could have something that breaks, you know, very far um, on the east-west extent, which would be very large, and it would be closer to the dams, and it would generate a much larger event, something very extreme and unlikely. And that's kind of what we're talking about, is that it could just be this really unlikely scenario where you have rupturing all along uh, that east-west extent um, of the fault itself. Then also consider the north-south component. That fault runs all the way from British Columbia down to California. So when I say extreme, we're talking about something that goes all the way that north-south south extent and is a very wide rupture as well. Um, but just to be clear, yeah, when we do talk about that likely scenario that uh, you mentioned the one in 500 year event, that is a 9.0 earthquake and that is something we consider and we do um, expect good performance in the dams in that most likely scenario. So I apologize, I didn't have a good visual prepared for that, but it's a complicated topic. I'm not a seismologist myself. Um, I have to try to interpret, we, you know, we interpret what these experts give to us and um, with my, my limited tools, that's the best way I can explain it to you. Does that help at all? Uh, yes, it did. Thank you very much. And I guess I'll just add, this is Matt again, there is sort of an analog we can look at as well for, you know, these are, again, rare events, but uh, you might remember back in 2011, there was a, a magnitude nine subduction zone earthquake in Japan. So the, the Tohoku earthquake, uh, and you might recall that resulted in a large tsunami, a lot of loss. Um, but um, I think that it, that earthquake affected like around 400 dams or something like that. And of all those dams, only one failed out of that event, which is kind of an older agricultural dam, I believe. So, um, you know, there is a data point there that is kind of a similar, you know, kind of a similar event to what, you know, we might be able to expect here. So, so just, uh, and there, there are some, if you want to do a look on the internet, there's, it's, I think it's a Tohaku event and you can look that up and there's some papers written about that there as well. So there is some information out there. Thank right. you everybody for coming to our November ARCO meeting. Um, I just wanted to uh, invite you to, if you want to get the newsletter or check our website, uh, we will post this on the website, the recording on the website and um, the newsletter posts lists uh, meeting times for this committee that works so hard on this and future general meetings of the Neighborhood Association. So, um, Jackie, Charlesy, thank you so much for your hard work. Do you need to anything else to sign off? I think Jackie might have some comments. Uh, my last comment was just, I wanted to thank Matt and Dustin and Natalie and the rest of their team for coming tonight and answering these questions. No doubt we may not have had firm answers on everything, but we will be following up on stuff over the coming weeks and months. Great, and thanks to our guests once again and all our attendees, <laughs> good night. So, Thank you. Save the chat. I'll Thank save you. the chat. <laughs>